our int formal introduction will be Marisa Chappelle. So I won't uh, go on for too long. I'll just give us our ground rules. Number one, please turn off your phones. Right? Classic thing, but it happens that they ring and they ring, including speakers. <laughs> I was just at a conference where someone someone was using uh, Find Their iPhone and it kept going and going and going and going and they took it to the next room and it still went. And then the next room we could hear it and then they took it outside the building and you could still hear it. <laughs> so let's try to avoid that. Uh, second, we've got a bunch of food and drinks, so please take some. Um, they're here to help fuel us to think a little bit about uh, the military welfare state, citizenship, and an array of things. Uh, third, um, this will be about a 45 minute talk, and then we'll have some Q&A, and our hope is that we have uh, a really lively discussion, so keep in mind you know, what kind of questions you might have, um, and we tri we'll try to wrap up uh, by no later than 5.30, just so you know sort of what the timeline will be. Um, so let me tell you just a little bit about the series that we're, uh, this, this talk is part of, um, and thank a few people. First, I should thank Marisa Chappelle, who helped me organize this, my great colleague and friend. Uh, also, uh, the OSU School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, uh, and School Director Ben Mutchler, and the College of Liberal Arts, uh, Larry Rogers, the Dean, uh, have all been integral in making this series work. Uh, and also, uh, Ryan Khalif, who's out front, uh, he's the lead intern for the Citizenship and Crisis Initiative, um, and has been doing a great job. There he is. Ryan, thank you very much for all of your great work. Um, first and foremost, this event is sponsored by the OSU Citizenship and Crisis Initiative. Uh, with help from funds from the Woman Citizen Fund, actually, which is, uh, and the Citizenship and Crisis Initiative is a multi-year programming project uh, which aims to bring the best of history and the humanities to a wider audience. Uh, we particularly explore questions related to citizenship, to crisis, and to the intersection of the two um, as a starting place to think deeply about, discuss, and debate questions of rights, obligations, limitations, and changing definitions of citizens and citizenship. And I can think of no better topic, frankly, than the question of uh, the US military and its relationship to the welfare state in dealing with these kinds of questions. Um, in essence, our work is a project of engaged democracy through deployment of the best insights that we can glean from the humanities, and in this case, from history. Um, so without further ado, uh, please let me introduce Marissa Chappelle to introduce our great speaker today. <laughs> we can do right. more of that. Perfect. Yeah. I can introduce someone else. <laughs> yep. yeah. um, so uh, part of the motivation for bringing uh, Dr. Middlestadt here, other than that she's a wonderful scholar who's written a wonderful book, um, is that this year is the 20th anniversary of the so-called welfare reform <coughs> legislation uh, in 1996. Um, if you don't know, that legislation drastically changed the social safety net um, for low-income Americans. Um, and I'm not gonna build, give you a lesson here on that, but. In the context of that, we wanted to have some discussions about what the welfare state is, what it's looked like in the past, what it looks like today, and why. So, uh, Dr. Jennifer Middlestead is a historian of 20th century United States whose work explores the intersections of politics, social policy, women and gender, social movements, and the military and militarization. She earned her doctorate at the University of Michigan and um, was an assistant and then associate professor of history and women, gender, and sexuality studies, right? At, at Penn, Penn State. State. At, um, at Pennsylvania State University, and is now professor of <coughs> history at Rutgers University. Dr. Middlestadt's first book, From Welfare to Workfare, The Unintended Consequences of Liberal Reform, 1945 to 1965, which came out from the University of North Carolina Press, located the roots of the 1990s welfare reform in the shifting landscape of post-war liberal policy, politics. She also co-authored Welfare in the United States, A History with Documents, published by Rutledge. Her with, most with Professor Chappelle. <laughs> She's my co-author. <laughs> Some really smart people. Um, <laughs> her most recent book, The Rise of the Military Welfare State, right here, um, out last year from Harvard University Press, and from which today's talk is drawn, chronicles the extension of benefits to enlisted men and women um, in the shift to an all-volunteer army which created a military welfare system of unprecedented size and scope, even um, as the United States dismantled its civilian welfare system in the 1980s and 1990s. The book explores the ways in which the anti-welfare rhetoric um, more broadly affected political and policy debates over veterans' benefits and rolled back the military welfare state at the very time that a new era of war began. As one reviewer observed, it is a provocative, informed, and disturbing book that provides an essential perspective on the modern U.S. armed forces. 
Dr. Middlestadt's published widely in both scholarly and public forums, um, and uh, I'm going to shorten this, and has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. She's a public intellectual, exactly what Citizenship and Crisis is doing here. She's been interviewed all over the place, um, PBS, C-SPAN, um, podcasts, etc. And she's currently working on a project about U.S. empire in the late 20th century. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Middlestadt. Thank you so much, Chris and Marissa, for that nice introduction. And I also want to say thank you to Natalia for sort of seamlessly organizing this whole visit here. I'm very grateful. And I'm really happy to be here as part of this overall initiative that you have here on citizenship in crisis because as Chris said sort of thinking that my subject was a good fit for this I was thinking what a good fit my discussions were my thoughts were for a really organized ongoing discussion about citizenship indeed this is probably the most perfect venue I could imagine for the issues that I want to talk about and that I've written about. So I'm really delighted to be here. Also, never been to Oregon, so super excited to be in Oregon <laughs> for the first time. And I saw a redwood tree, which I've never seen either. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start um, with a story. Uh, it's a story I tell in the book. Um, and it's a story about how I came to write about the military and social welfare, um, and how I sort of came to the subject, um, or rather, I guess, how the subject came to me, because I, I didn't plan on it. So uh, in about 10 or 11 years ago, I was walking down a street in Brooklyn, New York, where I lived at the time, and I started eavesdropping on cell phone conversation. And there was a man who was walking in front of me, he was talking quite loudly and energetically, um, and I just was drawn in to the conversation. And it turned out that he was an army recruiter. Um, as I followed him for several blocks and continued to listen, I sort of made, <laughs> made all this out. And um, he was trying to convince a woman to join the army. Now, it was probably not the only conversation that he ever had with her, not the first conversation, but in this particular conversation, he talked about some things that I did not expect. And I should say, I have not been in the military. Um, I don't have close family members who were in the military or career military. So I didn't have a lot of experience with the recruitment process. I didn't have a lot of experience with the military period. But he didn't talk about anything that I expected. And I think those expectations were probably shaped by what you see in advertising and in popular culture. So I thought maybe that he would be convincing her to join by talking about the possibilities for personal achievement within the military, which comes from that 1980s be all you can be type of mm -hmm. advertisement. Then I thought, well, maybe he'll talk about her sort of becoming a steel warrior of some kind, which was consistent with the Army of One campaign for recruitment in the 1990s, but he didn't talk about either of those things, at least not in this phone call. Instead, what he said was this. He said, the Army will get you out of credit card debt, and it will teach you to handle your money. You will get health care, and you'll get child care for your kids. So I, not being a military historian either, but being a historian of politics and social welfare, had thought many times about programs such as childcare or healthcare. I had studied them, I had written about them, but I had never understood that I might find them in the context of the military. And so for me, it was a bit of a provocative moment, um, a bit of a revelation for me. So it was in the day before I had a smartphone, so actually um, I ran um, what is the title? <laughs> into this bank. Uh, which is on the corner of Montague Street in downtown Brooklyn. And I grabbed the deposit slip and I flipped it over and I wrote, is the military some kind of a welfare state? <laughs> and, you know, wrapped it up, put it in my pocket, and went home. And over the next couple of years, I s returned to the question and I started to ask myself, what would it mean as a scholar of politics and social policy 
to look at an institution that wasn't normally considered an institution of social policy, to look at the military, to bring the military within the framework of a welfare state. So the first thing that I did, because I'm a historian, this is what historians do, is I checked out the other literature that existed to sort of say, is this something that I could do? What would it, you know, sort of what would it look like um, to do it? And so the first thing I did was went to my own literature, which was on social welfare in what I would now call the civilian sector, right? And there I was quite reassured, because actually our understandings of the welfare state have expanded markedly in the last 20 years. And so where typical scholarship on the welfare state in, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, focused mostly on very obvious government programs, like public assistance, which I myself have written about and wrote about with Professor Chappelle, or they focused on Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid, people were now starting to write about more hidden and less visible aspects um, of the welfare state. So the income tax system, for example, mm -hmm. which provides supports for people who are married, for home ownership, property ownership, and other things, is providing kind of economic security. They might look at the Federal Housing Authority and subsidized loans, for example, as a more hidden way that the state ensures the economic security and welfare of its citizens. They even started to look outside of the government entirely and to look at the way that the federal government in the United States had encouraged private entities, such as private employers and corporations, to in fact provide private social welfare services for which they received tax write-offs then. Right? So it's a kind of public-private system. Seeing this kind of capacious definition of the welfare state, I thought, well, yeah. I think probably the military would be something that I could fit into a study in this particular field. So then I turned to military history, which was where I had no personal training, and I had a very high learning curve. And in starting to get into the field of military history, one of the things that I came to understand was that military history itself was expanding its own concept of what constituted military history. And this comes from a white paper that the Society for Military Historians issued in 2014, where they talked about um, the need to move beyond the battlefield and troop movements and to incorporate what they call the new military history. This might be histories of the relationship of social movements, like civil rights, to the military. It might be business <coughs> historians who are looking at the military. It might be historians of social class, thinking about the relationship between you know, poverty and the military. It could be a lot of things. And it could also, I thought, possibly be a place where I could think about the connections between the military and social welfare. So thus assured, as historians like to be, I started to dig in. And what I found immediately also was that I was hardly the first person with my little scribble on the back <laughs> of a deposit slip to have thought about the relationship between the military and social welfare. There's a very rich literature in European history about how World War I and World War II and those massive mobilizations created the context for military, for, for welfare states in European countries. And there's also a robust literature in the United States, histories of uh, veterans benefits mostly, and the relationship of veterans benefits to the creation of broader social welfare policies. So Civil War era pensions, for example, which eventually provide a kind of model of what old age insurance will look like that we get eventually in the New Deal, and the GI Bill, of course, which has been studied absolutely as a form of social welfare that vaulted millions of people in the United States into the middle class. Even turning to the modern all-volunteer force, there were people who had also noted the relationship between that force and welfare. Although there had not really been a sustained academic study, certainly not a historical study of it, it was sort of common knowledge among military sociologists, among journalists who covered the military, and among military personnel themselves that the military in the modern volunteer era operated as a kind of, of welfare state. As Tom Ricks, who is a, a defense journalist, and still is a defense journalist, put it, the military in the modern volunteer era was a kind of great society, re referring to Lyndon Johnson's great society in camouflage. So in many ways, there were a lot of people who had already thought about these issues, and I felt like I was on good ground in starting to investigate this subject. 
but investigating it was quite a, a process. And the first thing I had to do was wrap my head around what constituted this collection of military social welfare programs in total. The stuff that the man on the street was referring to was really just the tip of the iceberg. So this is a pie chart that comes from the, DO, the Department of Defense, and it will give you a sense, this is not all of them, but it will give you a sense of what the programs look like that I had to wrap my head around and consider. Two things to note, they're comprehensive, cradle to grave coverage, comprehensive also in the sense that they include hard services like payments for housing or health care, but they include soft services like counseling, um, psychiatric and psychology, uh, after school programs for children, things like that. Second thing to note, they're universal. So in the all volunteer era, they cover every single member of the active duty forces and their immediate family members. So this is a sort of picture that I had to start to paint for myself to understand what it was that I was going to be investigating. I also had to get a sense of whether or not, <clears throat> of just how big the scope was, I guess, sort of how important it was. And one of the things that I learned quite quickly is that it's hard to quantify how important it is. The Department of Defense itself cannot total the amount that it spends on this. It doesn't know. Um, it doesn't know a lot about how much it spends because the budget is so vast and it's spread over so many different categories that it can be very hard to pull out particular numbers. And one of the things they can't pull particular numbers out on is quality of life. It's very, very difficult. However, they can sort of do these lump sum analyses that have to do with manpower costs that put together salary and all of the benefits and services that I'm looking at. And it turns out it is quite substantial. So personnel costs as early as the 1970s or 50% of the Defense Department budget. Now, not all of that is the benefits. Those benefits are a smaller percentage inside of that. But it's a very high percentage. It's significant. And the numbers actually, while the percentage of the budget might shrink with deployment or with how much we spend on weapons, the real spending has only grown since the 1970s onward, right? So in real dollars, the number has only gotten higher. So that was important for me to know. And then it was also important for me to know how many people were affected by active duty military welfare state programs. And it's a fair amount. So there have been over 10 million people who volunteered since the beginning of the all-volunteer force. And then they're outnumbered roughly two to one by family members. So we're really looking at tens of millions of Americans who have participated in one way or another in programs that the military offers around social welfare. I also had to try to understand very early on, I tried to wrap my head around what made these programs different from earlier programs, like the veterans programs I mentioned, Civil War era pensions, or there were World War I expansions of help um, for military personnel, and the GI Bill. One of the key differentials here um, is that these programs serve active duty, not veterans. So that has to be clear. I'm really looking at stuff that is programs for active duty personnel. That means that it's a self-select group of people who volunteer. It's not a wide swath of the population who's drawn in through a draft, right? It also means that the function that these all these programs serve is different. Veterans programs reward people for service. These are not rewards. These are actually enticements to enlist and to re-enlist. They're for recruitment and for retention. And they're, they're absolutely central to the success of the volunteer force. And one of the things that I noticed immediately was that particularly the Army, which is the branch of the services that I study, the largest, most number of people moved quickest to create these programs in the volunteer era, most worried about conversion from the draft. They immediately recognize that what they're calling fringe benefits or benefits are going to have to be a central component for the success of the volunteer force. Frankly, they won't be able to man the force without it. So they're, they're really different in significant ways um, from other programs. The last way that they're different is that they are created in a context that's different from earlier ones. So whereas during World War I, 
This was a period in general of expansion of social welfare coming out of the progressive era. And World War II was a period of expansion of civilian welfare coming out of the New Deal. And then there are enormous expansions in the 40s and the 1950s of things like social security to reach like 90% of Americans. This is a period in the late 20th century of the contraction of civilian social welfare, of attacks on social welfare. So the political context in which these are being created is different. And so sort of getting the lay of the land of all of this, um, I, you know, I set out really on the process of researching it all and writing the book. So the book itself addresses the history of these military social welfare programs through the Army. Um, and it tells the story in two ways. So first it tells the story of the Army and the Army's welfare programs themselves. So it looks at their architects, it chronicles what the beneficiaries of those programs looked like, how and under what circumstances new programs were created, and what the programs meant both for soldiers um, and for families, as well as what they meant for the Army and its functioning. But also, in keeping with my training as a historian of politics and social policy, I also sort of pushed beyond the boundaries of the military uh, and the army. And, and I tried to consider what the military welfare state meant for civilians and for civilian social welfare. <laughs> and in turn, what civilian social welfare meant for the development of army social welfare programs. Because once I started looking at this history in detail, I found that at no point in the history of the army's programs could the history of its programs be separated from what was going on in the civilian world. And indeed, I think far more than I imagined when I started the project, much of the wil military welfare state's fate, I think, hinged on its troubled relationship to civilian welfare programs. So what I want to do today is really dig now into, with this setting, the relationship between the US military citizenship and social welfare. And I want to spend the rest of the time um, making two arguments for you. The first argument I want to make is that the military welfare state was not an easy or a natural development. Indeed, I think building it was hard work. It was hard political work. It was hard in getting Congress to approve the programs. It was hard in wresting the money from their hands. It was hard in creating the kind of public political legitimacy that allowed for the building of this expensive program that served so many people. We really sort of can be duped in this day and age when we salute the troops and people wear ribbons and we thank them for their service that this is somehow natural. It's not. These arguments really had to be made and it was quite difficult. And what I noted is that as those arguments were made, as that hard political work was done, what often happened is that army leaders, soldiers and their families, and allies in Congress pursued what I would call a politics of separation. And that politics of separation was separation from civilians. It was a separation from civilians and civilian welfare programs. Let's put it another way. It's like the army was creating new kinds of social welfare programs, but denying that they were, in fact, social welfare programs by contrasting them with those in the civilian world. Second, I'll argue that this politics of separation was quite successful, but only for a time. It turned out that the military welfare state had opponents, it had doubters, it had critics, both within the military and outside of the military. And their opposition was based in large part on their understanding of civilian social welfare and what it meant to bring social welfare programs into a military context. The efforts of those opponents began immediately in the 1970s with the creation of the volunteer force and the programs, and they continued pretty much unabated over the years. But they really achieved success in the 1990s. They paved the way for a transformation of the military welfare state that I'll talk about in the course of this uh, discussion today. They transformed it in a way that made it not so unlike, ironically, what happened to civilian social welfare. It came under attack, 
the programs were privatized, they were outsourced, and they became quite concerned, like civilian social welfare programs, with fighting dependency among soldiers and soldiers' families. So a quick disclaimer, the are these two arguments that I'm going to make today are two of, of several distinct arguments in the book that are all interrelated, so I'm sort of doing some violence here to the flow and complexity of the actual history itself. And also, the argument that I'm making partakes of sort of almost every chapter in the book, so you're losing kind of the rich context in which some of the events I'm going to talk about actually happen, but I think it's worth the effort in order to draw out these discussions that we want to have about citizenship, the military, and, and welfare. So, to my first argument. This argument that the military welfare state grows because key military leaders, soldiers, people in Congress, make distinctions between themselves and their benefits and civilians and their social welfare programs. The first thing I want to say is it's not new to claim that soldiers have a special status. This was precisely how the Civil War era pensions uh, were justified. It's how the World War I era and World War II era benefits were justified as well. However, in the era of the volunteer force, the distance between soldier and civilian with no mass armies and no conscription was probably further than it had ever been, right? <clears throat> I'm gonna focus on the moment of origins of the all-volunteer force and the origins of this politics of separation because that moment of origin determines the whole arc of this politics of separation throughout the period that I'm looking at. So I'm gonna take you back to the 1970s. This origin of the all-volunteer force, the origin of the social welfare state. So the army is making the argument that it needs to expand its traditional benefits, those once reserved for career personnel and for officers to all of its members and to all ranks and to their families. And it's saying we have to create new and better programs than, uh, than we already have because there's no other way to recruit and retain people. But this 1970s moment when they're making these arguments is also a moment of enormous economic crisis in the United States. And the military welfare state sort of runs smack into it. So your 70s history, energy crisis, 1973, an enormous recession, the biggest since the Great Depression, the advent of high levels of inflation and unemployment at the same time, which people come to call stagflation. And what it means in Washington is severe austerity, budget cutbacks. And all kinds of federal programs are put on the table for Congress to consider cutting. Civilian social welfare programs are on the table. The pay and benefits of all kinds of federal employees from the Park Service to the Department of State, they're all on the table military benefits are on the table too. So it's a, it's a very difficult and fraught time. This context of confrontation is important because the military makes some very important decisions right in this early period of time and in this context of crisis to sort of start on this path of a politics of separation. And I'm gonna talk about three ways that it produces this politics of separation. The first, is by choosing a very particular metaphor and symbol to describe the new programs that it wants to create as part of the all-volunteer force. And that metaphor is the family. The Army revives this phrase, which had been used here and there over the course of its history that there had been an Army family, and really makes it sort of a motto. This is an advertisement for the Army, um, and it says, the, today's army is a family, an army family of armies, and it goes on to talk about the army family and to advertise to its own soldiers why they should stay in and re-up, re-enlist. It takes this further, and it says that the army family takes care of its own. The army takes care of its own. This phrase had also been used in the past by the army. World War II, um, the Red Cross used it, actually, in taking care of all the soldiers who were mobilized for that. But it sort of like dwindled in usage. Well, the Army brings it back with the advent of the all-volunteer force, and they use it in conjunction with the metaphor of the Army family. And they say the Army is a family that takes care of its own. And the important things to know here are just a few. Number one, it's very good for recruitment and retention, because the family model 
um, sort of suggest the kind of cohesion and loyalty that the all-volunteer force wants to present. But more important for the benefits, it sets up a kind of family and paternal relationship where the army is the father, if you will, that takes care of its soldiers. And that these benefits actually are very quite natural then. They're just what any family member would do for any other family member. And they create a kind of in-group, right, of people who are in the family and those who are outside of the family who, don't, who are not taken care of because they're not inside the family. Perhaps the most important thing to note about it is this. If you were to look at civilian social welfare, you would nowhere find a metaphor of family to describe the rationale for why it's being given. There's no family of social security or a family of Medicare. Those are more one-to-one -one relationships of having worked and, and been an economic citizen and putting in your money and getting it back, a more actuarial kind of representation. So it's a very unique choice that they make that in and of itself I think is remarkable in that particular period of time. But what's more remarkable are the reactions that people in the military have to the threat of the potential benefit cuts that might come down the pike should the austerity in Congress go through. And there are many in Congress who are saying, listen, if we're going to cut civilian programs, we have to cut the military as well at the same time. In the event, just so we're clear, military benefits are never cut in the 1970s. They're not cut in the 1980s either. They're not cut in the 1990s cuts either. The real growth is always there. But the, the discussion about whether it will happen is really, really threatening and confusing to the people who are trying to start an all-volunteer force based on its benefits. So a few things start to happen. One is, is in, in the course of mounting a defense for why they should have these benefits and why they shouldn't be cut, they start to talk about why their benefits are more worthy than any benefits that civilians might get. And this is a discussion that I saw in testimony in Congress by military leaders, but also they called individual military personnel to testify. It's a discussion I saw in military professional organizations like the Association of the US Army. And it's a discussion I saw a lot in the pages of Army Times where people write in letters to the editor. And I have drawn some examples here. But what you start to see is that as the stories come through about, hmm, maybe we'll think about cutting back on pensions, or maybe we'll think about cutting the housing allowance, you get a very vocal pushback. And that pushback is explicit. If you're thinking about cutting anything, you need to cut civilian welfare programs. These programs are undeserved, and they are wasteful, as opposed to the military benefits. And this kind of discourse would have been no one in the military who was serving in World War II would have even had a frame of reference for making this kind of argument, right? So this is really a new argument that's coming with the distinction of turning to a volunteer force and the distinction of having to create all of these active duty benefits. And military personnel and their wives, army, excuse me, soldiers and their wives, that's what I'm looking at, are really feeling the sting um, of having their benefits on the table alongside those of civilians and having any kind of comparison at all. I mean, this woman doesn't even want to have the military's health care program for, for families mentioned in the same breath um, as Medicaid. She finds it insulting and she finds it demeaning. And so this really is a kind of politics of separation, mm -hmm. of distance, that I think becomes quite important in making the case for why military benefits are separate and different from civilian benefits. The second define, like really defining moment that comes out of crisis and fear is a story that most people don't know about. In the midst of all of this difficulty in Washington, the largest employee, uh, the largest union of federal employees, which is the American Federation of Government Employees, is worried that it's pay and benefits are going to be cut by Congress. And it's looking around for ways that it can really throw its weight around and threaten Congress. And what they decide to do is to vote to unionize the new all-volunteer force. So there would be a unionized army. The argument they make is, well, you're the ones who went from a draft to a volunteer force. Used to be a burden of citizenship. Now, it's a job. 
job, we can unionize. So at first, it's really interesting. About a third of all army personnel are in favor of going with the union because they think Congress is not reliable and that this union is big and will threaten effectively. So they say, okay, maybe we should do this. But then they start to think more deeply about it. What does it mean to have soldiering equated with being a job or being employment? And this is a, one of several cartoons that appears in Army Times that sort of gives you the sense of what they're thinking down the pike if they go the union route, what will happen with their benefits. So here's Congress. It's stripping military benefits from this poor little skinny military guy and the big fat union guy who appears to be wearing a dunce hat here. And he actually has like five arms, you know, <laughs> says, I suppose he's, I feel like he says it like this, you know. <laughs> but the more they shave it down to any old job, the sooner I'll take it over. And the idea is that if you go the union route to protect your benefits, you could protect your benefits, but it's going to be any old job. And then soon it really won't be very valuable at all. And so the Army is never unionized. And there are a lot of reasons why this never happens that I can talk about. But what's important is that the threat of unionization jumpstarts this discussion about distancing the new volunteer force from any concept of being connected to civilians. If we don't have a welfare state, also, it's not employment, it's not work. We're not like civilians. And it occasions this really robust discussion in the Army about just exactly, precisely how soldiering is not work. It's never work. And so here you have, this is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, who's just saying, he has this tautology in operation here that I don't see any, I don't see any, you know, com, you know, comparison between a civilian and a soldier because there is no comparison between a civilian and a soldier. <laughs> and then also Don Rumsfeld, who at that time is also uh, Secretary of Defense, he has two stints as that, um, talks about how insulting and demeaning it is to be compared to a civilian. And so it's really a moment of very stark separation right at the beginning of the volunteer force, in which both soldiering itself and the volunteer force, but also all of the benefits that they're creating, are made completely distinct from the civilian world in a way that they really had not been fully distinct before. What happens after the threat of unionization is that Congress, once they see these arguments, stops saying that they might threaten to cut military benefits. And instead, they come out, and even the harshest critics of military benefits, like Les Aspen and William Proxmire of Wisconsin, say, never mind. What we should do is build up these military benefits. This really is something different and special, and it, we cannot have it on the table alongside civilian social welfare benefits. So it's quite a successful strategy at that point in time. Um, this politics of separation then works pretty well. Works well in the 70s and gets them out of this crisis. It works quite well in the 1980s, which is really the apogee of the creation of these programs under Reagan um, and his incredible defense spending. But for all of these successful efforts, the truth is that the military welfare state was never fully secure. These programs never achieved full political security and legitimacy. And this brings me to my second argument about opponents. The military welfare state from the start had opponents from both within and without. And that, just as the politics of separation was informed by certain understandings of civilian welfare, so too was this politics of opposition to the military welfare state informed by critics' understandings of civilian social welfare. So I'm gonna to talk to you first about the way that people within the military were dubious about the new military social welfare programs, and then about how people on the outside were. So I'm gonna start with the people on the inside. Um, this is uh, Robin Beard, who was a Republican uh, member of the House of Representatives from Tennessee. He was the only member of Congress who was also an active member of the military. He was a member of the Marine Corps Reserve while he was serving in Congress. And he was an enormous critic of the all-volunteer force, particularly the all-volunteer army. 
his main criticism, though he had many, was that the all-volunteer army was turning into a welfare institution. When he wrote a report in 1978 that came to be called the Beard Report, and when he presented it to Congress, the main, the first question he was asked in the main course of discussion was how the army was being degraded by turning into a welfare state. So what did those arguments look like um, about degradation? This was the first argument. The argument that was that if you create all these programs in the army, you will lure the dregs of American society. And that word is a quote that came um, from the chief of staff of the army. No, that quote came from the secretary of the army, excuse me, um, about the dregs. And you can see these various discussions both within the army, this is, uh, comes from an article about the army where he interviewed uh, a bunch of people within the army. This one is from the Beard Report. It basically suggests that if you offer welfare, you will get welfare clients. Those are the kind of people that you will get in the military. It's complicated by the fact that, in fact, the demographics of the military are changing with the volunteer force. So under the draft, you're much more likely to have uh, middle class people who were brought in one way or another. Not high proportions, but there were middle class people. With the switch to the volunteer force, the number of middle class people plummets enormously. It's a much more wor working class military. Also, the proportion of African Americans in the, all, in, in the draft army had been more closely approximating their proportion in the population. By 1979-1980, like fully a third of the army, talking about the army here, is African American. Under the draft, there had been about 1.5% women. By 1979, there are about 9%. Women. There's something going on here where what people are worrying about when they're worrying about bringing in the dregs is also what the changing faces of the military look like at that same time. And it's kind of all tangled up. But nevertheless, it proves to be a pretty decisive point of argument for those who are opposed to the military welfare state. A second argument that they make is that military social welfare programs are only coming about specifically because of all the women that we're letting in. And women have more welfare needs than men, right? And so there's a fear um, about feminizing the force. These are just the statistics in more detail that I gave you about women, and also about African-American women. Half of all women in the Army are African-American women. And there's the argument that these women are somehow the source of all the new programs that have to be created. Child care is a particular bugaboo for them, uh, the opponents. Um, in fact, of course, most of the women who are coming in are single and don't have um, children. It's the married men who are having the children. But nevertheless, it's seen in this light. The worries about the feminization also come from another group of women, which are all the army wives that come in. So with all the new benefits and the all-volunteer force, they know, I mean, the army starts to say, we recruit the soldiers, but we retain families. They bring in families, these soldiers, or they have families once they're in the army. And it turns out the wives are vocal. And they actually start a wives movement to expand benefits that are more, the kind of benefits that wives want to see. So help in finding jobs, for example. They do want more child care. Or they want after school programs. And you can see here, this is a typical letter around this time from an army wife that's saying, you keep telling me how you take care of your own. Well, I, you need to step up and provide some new programs. And basically, people like Robin Beard, who represents, who interviewed so many, sort of, it's mostly non-commissioned officers, uh, career personnel that he interviewed, but also retired people. They start to sort of see that overall what's happening with all of these women and all of these new programs is that in their mind, the army is turning into a babysitter. It's turning into kindergarten. It's turning into some kind of social welfare institution. And it is their contention that that degrades the military. And so you get this expression of, we're either a social welfare institution or a fighting machine. But we can't be both. And this is a very powerful argument. And it's made really explicitly in the late 1970s, right at the beginning of these programs. It's sort of tamped down during the 1980s, but it's a recurrent strain 
You could find it even today quite easily. If you just ask often enough or ask a few people, it'll come out. There's a discomfort at some level with what these programs might be doing to the Army in terms of degrading it and feminizing it. I want to talk about another source of the criticism, and this comes more from outside. And here we come back around to something that Professor Chappelle was talking about, which is the 1996 welfare reform. Civilian welfare reform discussions are going on in the 1990s. Bill Clinton runs with a promise to end welfare as we know it. There's a general concern among politicians at the state level and at the national level, among really academics who study poverty, uh, about dependency, about whether or not the welfare system in the United States creates dependency, what does it mean if people depend on the government for certain kinds of supports. And this finds its way into the Army in a really funny and unexpected way that I never knew that I would see. And it comes in through the first Gulf War in 1991. The Gulf War is the first time that the Army deploys, that the all-volunteer force deploys in a very big operation. And so the Army is always studying itself and decides that it's going to use this opportunity to study how do all of our social welfare programs and our family supports hold up when we actually mobilize and deploy and go to war. And the end result actually is they say, well, they performed really well, all these programs, but I think they performed actually a little bit too well. Because when we really started to look at it, here we have, this is, a, this is an entrant in the Army cartooning contest from the first Gulf War. So even while the war's going on, they're having a cartooning contest. This guy must have been, he must have been in the rear detachment. Um, his tagline is the Mad Bomber. And he shows this rear you know, detachment officer who's left behind as part of the family support from the unit that, that deployed. And it's just, these are, I don't know if you can tell, but these are all wives. And they're all sort of screaming with their mouths gaping open and it's like, I have no mail from my husband. I need a bus schedule. What's going on in the Gulf? When's my husband coming home? Where's the babysitter? My car won't start. It turned out that like that's the way the cartoonists saw it, but that's really the way the Army saw it as well when it did its after action report, that too many wives had asked too many things of the Army. Too many soldiers had asked their commanders to do too many things for their wives back home. The Army started to think it might have a dependency problem. and it decides that it's going to study it. And the way that it studies it is it hires civilians who study civilian social welfare programs to come into the military and examine soldiers and their families and its own social welfare programs and tell them what's going on. And what they tell them is you have a dependency problem. And they develop these theories of the overly dependent spouse, the overly demanding spouse, and the multi-problem army family. And this leads to a real change in the Army's attitude. And the Army decides, this is from their after action support, that they're going to redefine how it supports and assists families by emphasizing now self-sufficiency. Um, and it's going to make soldiers, not the Army, responsible for family readiness. The Army becomes reluctant to talk publicly about its programs as helping people. And instead, they start to talk publicly to the press about its programs as um, a preventative approach. It's not like we're trying to help people when they're down. We're not trying to, you know, give people a handout or anything like that. We're, we're, we're really creating self-sufficient people here. And it actually results in a change of official Army motto. So that Army motto of the Army family that takes care of its own becomes this sort of clunky phrase. <laughs> but the Army takes care of its own by teaching its own to take care of themselves. And if you if you sort of lost the meaning of that, you've got the giant <laughs> eagle over self-reliance um, here at the bottom. And so this is really a kind of wholesale appropriation of civilian social welfare discourse brought into an army that has been reluctant for some years about these programs and is now saying, all right, we understand we have to keep the programs, but we're going to make them sort of do a new thing. And the thing they're going to do is create self-sufficiency. Now the tagline is resiliency, for any of you who are, have recently been in the military. That's the tagline they use. The other source of criticism um, comes from a group of people you might also not expect to be interested in military uh, social welfare programs. 
and that is free market economists. This is Milton Friedman, who many people don't know is actually the architect of the all-volunteer force. Very influential, world influential free market economist from the University of Chicago. He and other free market economists together create the model for the all-volunteer force in 1968, um, after Nixon is elected. And when they make that model of no more draft, let's just use the market mechanism. Let's pay people and lure them in. They say, by the way, also all those benefits that you um, have, we should get rid of those too. And the reason why we should get rid of them is because free market economists in general don't advocate government programs. What they advocate are market-based solutions to problems. So the school voucher might be an analogy. Rather than having public schools, what we'll do is give people vouchers, and then they can go buy the schooling that they want. So what they proposed, actually, when they switched over, is they refused to endorse any expansions of benefits the way that the army itself wanted and, and thought it needed to do. Instead, what they said is, you'll just let's pay them a little extra added, and then if they want counseling, they can buy it. If they want after-school programs, they'll buy it. If they want health care for their wife, they'll buy it, right? So that's what they advocate. It doesn't go anywhere in 1968, 1970. Throughout the 70s, the Army pushes back and Congress pushes back. But they finally get a chance again in the 1990s. And the occasion for this actually is the drawdown that occurs as the result of the end of the Cold War. With the end of the Cold War, military spending is slashed. The military is looking around for things that it can do with the budget. There had been a recession, uh, and the general federal budget is in trouble. And a whole slew of things comes together that makes it more likely that these economists can have influence again. Key moments in this, just very quickly, are Al Gore's and, and Bill Clinton's National Performance Review, what Gore called Reinventing Government. Um, it's not really about efficiency. It's really about um, outsourcing and privatization. And one of the things that it does, it creates a new Office of Economic Security in the Department of Defense, to which Bill Clinton sends a man from Wall Street named Joshua Gottbaum. And he tells Gottbaum, your job is to outsource and privatize as much of this as you can in the DOD. Um, the low-hanging fruit that everyone wants to privatize among corporations and military contractors are the services in the military. So this is the Defense Science Board. This is their plan for outsourcing and privatization comes out in uh, 1996. Uh, the business Executives for National Security, another influential group um, of, of contractors and economists, they recommend it as well. And what they say is everything that's not war fighting should go out to the private sector. And this actually is more or less what happens. In the military, housing becomes completely privatized. So now 100% of continental United States military housing is privatized. It is not owned, operated, built, managed, anything by the military. Military health care for active duty personnel is privatized um, at the same time. Social work programs are privatized and outsourced. It's a massive outsourcing that you would see reflected in these kinds of numbers which show you military contracting. And the blue is the traditional military contracting, right? The blue is Army products. The purple is Army services. Social welfare programs are services, except for housing, which isn't a service. And what you can see is that this is growing um, as a proportion, right? It's like outstripping what people are, what they're spending on materiel um, and weapons. So this growth in services, when people think about military contracting, military contracting services, they think of Blackwater, but the big bucks aren't there. The big bucks are actually in this really boring military social welfare stuff. So actually, if you look now at the top contractors, well, this isn't now. This is, it's probably even different now. This is the 2009 numbers. You can see that there are huge healthcare companies, HealthNet, TriWest, Humana, that are among the largest military contractors. And also, what you can't see here is what Lockheed, Northrop, KBR, L3 all did, which was buy up military social welfare companies. So they bought up, they bought up, um, construction and housing management firms, they bought up healthcare, they bought up social work, uh, private social work companies. 
there's a bunch of other military services. They do like payroll services and analysis and things like that. They bought all these. So embedded within them now are all of these social welfare programs. So to bring it around to where I started, it, it turns out that when I overheard that guy walking down the street in Brooklyn talking about all of these benefits, what I didn't know is that by that time, this was no longer a public government set of welfare programs that took care of its own. By that point in time, it was actually public money, but a collection of contractors and private service providers who were not so much taking care of their own as they were on this mission of encouraging independence and <coughs> self-sufficiency. So it was quite a change in the fate of military social welfare programs and their relationship to civilians and entitlements over time. I think there are a lot of possible consequences that we could talk about. Um, Sort of in the Q of A, Q and A, we could talk about what it means for all the soldiers and families who are deployed to have a military social welfare system that operates like this. Um, we could talk about it, what it means for military contracting and the size of mili military contractors, how big they are and how they do their work and whether or not it's visible. Um, we could talk about what it means for the viability of the all volunteer force. If it was built on the premise of providing these, what does it mean when they're provided quite differently? But I think I would like to end a little bit by thinking about what it means for, for citizens and people who aren't in the military, too. Um, the latest proposals um, being put forward in the Defense Business Board and the Defense Science Board come very closely, um, they're closely associated with proposals from the Heritage Foundation which propose actually no more pensions, and instead moving either to a 401k system uh, for the military, with which we're all familiar already in the mm -hmm. civilian sector. We are, because our, most people already lost their pensions, right? Or not even that, but giving a lump sum to soldiers, which they could then invest in a, a private savings account, mm -hmm. which would be kind of an equivalent to privatizing Social Security. In healthcare, they're also suggesting a move from the already privatized healthcare systems to vouchers and which would you offer soldiers, say, is you don't have to enroll in this TRICARE privatized <laughs> system. We'll give you $30,000, and then you can decide if you want to buy your health care. It's essentially what Milton Friedman had proposed way back in 1968. The programs are not good for soldiers. This means less money, and it means less security. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. But I'll tell you what. I. I wonder whether it's good for civilians either. Because if even our vaunted service personnel to whom we pay tribute in all these public venues, right, if they can have this taken away, what does it mean for you or me or, or, or the rest of us? And it does suggest to me that this long-term politics of separation is probably not a healthy one. And that to the degree to which people who are serving in the military and people in civilian world can find the convergence in their fate, really both as citizens, with the changing political economy of, of the welfare state. Um, we can only find gains. There are no losses there now. So that's it.